When the Global GT Championship got underway at Paul Ricard, the turbocharged Ferrari F40s were, as usual, on the front row. But only once have the fragile machines beaten the dominant McLarens to the finish line. At Ricard, they were reliable, but they were also thirsty. And an extra fuel stop allowed the Gulf McLaren of Ray Belm and his new teammate, James Weaver, to take a relatively comfortable 25-second victory in their brand new 1996 McLaren F1 after four hours of racing. Round two on Ferrari territory at Monza saw the prancing horses in front again, but this time the mechanical gremlins were back and both retired before half distance. The McLarens took over in the lead, but a territorial dispute with John Nielsen put James Weaver into the gravel and he wasn't impressed. While the leading Harrods car, having survived a lost wheel, retired with a broken clutch, leaving the 1995 champions John Nielsen and Thomas Bescher to score their first points of the season with a win. The last time you saw this McLaren F1 GTR, it was being abandoned in a Monza gravel trap by a very disgruntled James Weaver. This weekend, it's out in the third round of the Global GT Championship at Harama in Spain. But before it does that, I'm going to get to drive it. Now, you may remember that I tested the road-going version of the F1 on Top Gear a couple of years ago and found it sensationally fast. But it wasn't a racing car. The springs and dampers were soft, so it rolled too much on the track. And the brakes weren't up to endurance racing. To adapt it for competition, Gordon Murray lowered and stiffened the car, swapped the active aerodynamics for a proper racing wing and modified the front end to improve grip. The end result was immensely successful. They won Le Mans at their first attempt and they won all but one of the 1995 Global GT Championship races. In fact, they began to look too dominant and so the rules have been amended to try and hold them back a bit. Regulation changes have meant the McLaren have had to abandon their two-tier wing and replace it with one with a single plane. The organisers have also reduced the air intake to the engine as they try to keep power outputs down to about 600 horsepower. So McLaren have redesigned the car to fight back and regain some of that lost lap time. They've taken 100 kilos of weight off the car, lowered the engine and gearbox by 15 millimetres, redesigned both rear and front suspension, and homologated a new front splitter. But have all these changes been worthwhile? They certainly have, yes. We could have taken the um, route of updating our last year's car, but we decided to buy the new package from McLaren because um, the reduced weight in particular has meant far less wear on the tyres, and already we are going faster this year than we were last year, even though we have a reduction in power. McLaren then have done all this work over the winch on the chassis. Um, have BMW also been working on the engine? Yes, BMW has done a lot of work over the winter, both on the mechanical parts of the engine and on the electronic side of it, um, all with a view to helping us regain some of the power that we will have lost due to the smaller air restrictors. Now, getting into the road car was quite difficult, but this racing version with a rollover gauge, it's almost impossible to get in it. Now, the interior of the road car was pretty spartan, but this racing version there's no luxury at all. Gone are the nice etched dials to be replaced by an LCD digital display system. The space where I put my golf clubs has been filled by a lot of electronic gadgetry. Also, no sound system. But there's no better sound than that BMW V12. I'd been warned that the engine has got so much torque that a clumsy prod on the throttle with gripless cold tyres will snap the car sideways in an instant. So I eased out of the pit lane slowly, very slowly. On track then for an F1 GTR McLaren, the bee's knees of global GT racing. And I'm very nervous about really pushing such a machine. Road car very soft, gives you instant feedback. Racing car, stiff suspension. The breakaway is much more sudden. And if it goes, it's going to be quick to catch it. 
I took a few more laps than usual to bring the McLaren up to speed as I gently tried to feel my way in, very conscious of the fact that it was needed for a race in just a few days' time. Right, I'm just beginning to really push this McLaren a bit now, but I still haven't found its limits. That's nice, balanced understeer turning in, neutral on the way out as that power chimes in. Oh, down the third, through this little kinky bit. Oh, oh, back, brakes, feed it into the little understeer as I'm going in. I'm just wary of the step to oversteer, which hasn't come yet. In the end, it never did come, which was probably a good thing. Fourth, third, into paddock. This swoop downhill. Oh, break. The carbon brakes really warming up now. Very effective indeed. A lot of lock needed. Steering's getting heavier as the tyre temperatures come in. Feed, feed, feed. Four, 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 power. Yeah. Oh, flip, turn. Bit more power. Back on the brakes. This Brands Head short circuit is not best suited for a 200 mile an hour Le Mans winning McLaren. And it's not really the sort of place you want to learn about such a car either. But I'm not complaining. Yeah. Goes quicker and quicker. Oh! Uh, yes, yes, yes! Whoa. Now, having driven this McLaren for a few laps now, I've got a sneaky suspicion that the reason why this machine is understeering the bit is that the team has set it up to be safe for their guest driver. It's an old trick, but all I'm really getting from this beauty is a bit of understeer. But to be honest, I'm very happy it's like that, because I don't want to be putting a million dollars worth of motor car backwards into the scenery. Because then, they'd never ask me back to have another go in such a glorious thoroughbred GT racing car.